Hi, and thank you for joining us today for the discussion on public service broadcasting and impartiality. We're delighted you've been invited here by the BBC to talk about this vital topic as both informed experts and citizens. And on behalf of both the BBC and the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, I want to say how much we're looking forward to this. Today, we're going to hear from Tim Davey, the BBC's Director General, and from Professor Rasmus Nielsen, Director of the Reuters Institute. Rasmus will present some recent research on the challenges of impartiality and audience attitudes towards news. And then we'll come back to me and I'll open up the discussion. A few housekeeping notes just before we begin. This meeting is being recorded, so it's on the record, and it'll be made available on the Reuters Institute website and YouTube channel. Please turn your mobiles to silent and switch off Outlook email notifications if you can. And if you're using an iPad, turn off incoming calls. And for the opening remarks from Tim and Rasmus, please ensure your microphones are on mute, but do please feel free to keep your cameras on because we'd like to make this an interactive session afterwards. And in the discussion afterwards, if you'd like to raise your hand or ask a question, please raise your hand using the kind of the Zoom function and unmute yourself when you start speaking. Live subtitles are also available. You can switch them on from your settings. And in the meantime, thank you for being here and over to you, Tim. Thank you, Mira, and um, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's a, uh, a really impressive group, actually. So I think uh, uh, we'll, I'll get my opening remarks out of the way quite quickly so we can hear from uh, Rasmus. I, and I'm, I'm hugely grateful to Rasmus and the Royce's Institute for being part of this conversation, uh, which really, as you said in your very opening remarks, I think is as important as it's ever been. <laughs> and is a, is a really critical topic um, for us to discuss. Um, just in terms of my opening remarks, I think um, uh, many of you heard, uh, many of you looking down the list have heard me talk at length about impartiality, but I, I would just make the following observations. One is, I think if anyone uh, was in danger of underestimating the risks, because I think a number of groups like ourselves have talked about the risks in terms of um, uh, impartial, objective news based on truth. And we can talk beyond news, but particularly in this discussion on news, we've been talking about the risks for a while, but I have to say, I think if you look at, well, we could take today for <laughs> today's debates, but the risks seem incredibly real. And if you look, I mean, I've talked publicly about um, the situations with some of our journalists, whether it's John Sudworth leaving, China, whether it's Sarah Rainsford, uh, not being able to report in Russia. I think we're in a very dangerous situation where the threats to uh, truth telling and impartial reporting globally have never been more serious. They are serious and they reside not just in, if you like, areas like China and Russia, where we may be more um, we may be more um, conditioned to those dilemmas. Our data suggests actually that the polarization in places like the US in terms of their media is really beginning to have an effect in how society thinks and how polarized it is. And I think it is a first order issue for us uh, as democracies to now really think about how we address this. Um, interestingly, if you talk to audiences, I mean, Rasmus will have better research as ever than I do but the, on this topic, but. Interestingly, we just had some, this is hot off the press, some just new research that we've just done. And if you wanted to be slightly cheered, the intent in the public is overwhelming in terms of their desire to be served with impartial news. Nine out of 10 adults, that's 87% of adults in the UK, say impartial news coverage is more important to them personally, personally than news coverage that reflects their point of view. And this number is 80% amongst 18 to 34. So it's still very strong. Now we can then debate behavior resulting from that good intent, but actually the intent is clear. People want impartial news. And nine out of 10 adults, actually 91%, say that impartial news coverage is more important to society than news coverage that reflects their point of view. And critically, if you look at a country like the UK versus the US, we see trust levels remaining high on national news sources, 
in the 70 to 80% range, where in other countries, that number is beginning in certain segments of society to collapse, to collapse. And that is a significant problem, but it also tells you we've got to protect something fiercely in the UK. Very quickly, I think um, people will know that as Director General, General, I was very clear on what people value from the BBC and looking to double down on those unique attributes so that every household gets value for their £159 licence fee here in the UK, but also we're doing the right thing for the nearly half a billion people that come to our news services globally. Um, and we've obviously set impartiality as a priority. It's not been an easy, an easy journey for us over the last 18 months as we're in the midst of culture wars, debate, uh, you know, all the polarised uh, debates that we're in, in the midst of. But we do have our new impartiality guidelines for journalists and staff. We've got our new rules on social media, which uh, many of you are aware of, on declarations of interest. We've got a comprehensive 10-point plan that I recommend for those who are interested that came out of the Sorota Review. Again, many of you on this group would have been through that. And we're also doing regular thematic reviews in key areas of public debate using external leads to come in, reporting to the board to look at topics and checking on our progress in terms of delivering against impartiality. And that is utterly central to my tenureship and the people uh, that are leading the BBC, that we fight the good fight to maintain impartiality. When people join the BBC, that is not often easy in terms of ensuring they think truly about how we deliver on the impartial uh, brief and our mission. Um, and the good news, if I may wave the flag for a little bit, is we are maintaining our numbers pretty well. Despite all the noise, uh, eight out of 10 adults use BBC news services every week, and that's holding. Of course, the COVID weather, uh, geopolitics keeps serving up news story after news story, but we're doing pretty well. And half of all adults say they come to us first to find out about news that's happening in the UK and the world. The nearest to us is at 10%, which is Sky, so we're clearly in a, a category of one there. And uh, for younger, provi younger audiences, this is important. Uh, sorry, 42% of 18 to 40, uh, 34s. Sorry, I'll get my number. 42% of 18 to 34s. Again, next nearest uh, Sky, Twitter at 12%. We are the biggest source for 18 to 34s in the UK. Uh, we've got lots of work to do. We're healthily paranoid about the issue, but we're still number one by a mile in terms of the first source of news. Finally, for me, it's kind of what, what, what are our priorities with regard to making impartiality come alive? In people's, in people's worlds over the next um, period uh, at the BBC. And critically, this isn't just a defensive play. It's not about just defending our territory as something that is um, precious in terms of impartiality, truth-telling, balanced reporting. It's also about being confident and making that an exciting, engaging and interesting uh, news environment. And I think there's a few tactics that we're going to be deploying in that area. And let me quickly do that for 30 seconds and then I'll move off. I mean, obviously, we've got um, Deborah Turness, who I've hired to run uh, the news operation in the UK. So she can she can bring this to life in a way I never can. I never will be able to. And, and, and actually, her vision will be very important to this. But I think there's a few things I'd say, uh, you know, probably four things that are in my head in terms of how we really make sure that uh, this whole topic is is engaging to all audiences, not the dry side of news, but actually some of the most interesting in, and the most entertaining, dare I say, bits of news coverage. The first is, I think, technology and how we use that to bring data to life. You know, it, it, there's incredible opportunities using digital technologies to bring about fact-based reporting, impartial reporting, cutting edge technology that can be delivered to reporters on the ground in real time, new formats, and I think we're at the foothills of that. The second is, I mentioned format, but think about, you know, our global news podcast. Now, the biggest news podcast, I think, on the planet, uh, newscast, these, these different formats where we're beginning to bring people objective reporting in different ways. And of course, you, you'll have seen the UK, Ross Atkins, currently the number one video in the UK is him explaining some, uh, an explainer on the Russia situation. Um, Ross is doing, you know, his Partygate video did 10 million views. 
it's a different way. It's a different tone. It's a different narrative. And I think you'll see more of that from us. Last couple of things, I think you'll see increased regionalism and localism. And that links to my technology point that the biggest television program in the UK yesterday on linear television was, guess what, 6.30 regional news. Again, by far the biggest program. Those who know me well will know that I always take the chance to wave the flag for the 6.30 in the regional news. But that's going to become more important, objective, factually based, local and regional news. And then the other side is leveraging our deep international strength. People want things explained uh, at length, long reads, and I think we need to be more confident about that. So I need to breathe more oxygen, I think, into this debate, not just in terms of the editorial possibilities, not just the limitations and the constraints of impartiality. That's the real challenge as, for myself as editor-in-chief. Um, and with that, I will hand to Rasmus, who can um, give us a little bit of data um, to go beside that and then open up the conversation. Thanks, Rasmus. Thanks very much, uh, Tim. Um, so, I mean, I suppose that I would like to speak uh, to the connection between um, impartiality um, and what I call the, um, the journalist's uh, trilemma. So the question for me is what audience research can tell us about the public's perception of some of the issues around partiality in news, how citizens approach this, um, and the choices that news media organizations have to face. Um, like independent news, I don't think that independent research dictate decisions, but I hope that it can inform it the same way that independent news can inform citizens' decision making. I suppose where I'd like to start is uh, in the same place that uh, Tim um, journeyed to, which is that our survey data too uh, suggests that a very clear majority of the UK public wants news outlets to reflect a range of different views, and very few believe that news outlets should argue for the views that they um, think are the best. Now, there are many different ways to think about impartiality, but I think that's one of them, and we have other questions too on the topic. For example, if we turn to the question of whether outlets should give equal time to all sides or give less time to the sides that the outlet think has a bigger argument, Again, a clear majority um, says equal time and a small minority uh, say less time to the argument that an outlet feels has a weaker case. Um, there is a significant minority um, who believe that there are some issues where it makes no sense for news outlets to try to be neutral. Um, but it's also the case that a majority do believe that news outlets should try to be neutral um, on every issue. I think this in a way is the hardest test perhaps in particular in increasingly polarized societies where there are issues of great importance that we disagree vigorously over and where people may well want uh, more clear throated voices. There are some groups who are particularly uh, likely to hold this view um, in the UK, uh, in particularly uh, younger people, the age of 24 year old demographic is sort of evenly split in terms of views in this matter between those who say neutrality, those who say no sense to try to be neutral on every issue and then a large number of people who have no view and also um, on the political left in the UK, the 17% um, who in our surveys identify as very or fairly left wing, there is actually a, a majority uh, who believe there are issues on which it makes no sense for news outlets to try to be neutral. These groups are um, not that prominent in most established news media, um, but compared to the general public, uh, our data show they are much more active on Twitter and those who say they're on the left politically are much more likely to comment on news stories uh, on social networks uh, such as Facebook. I think that may help explain why the desire for greater moral clarity um, on some contentious issues may sometimes seem more widespread online than it is uh, in the public at large. Now, <clears throat> given the demographics um, of those who are most likely to say that they desire uh, sort of uh, greater moral clarity and that there are issues where it makes no sense for news outlets to try to be neutral. I don't think it'll surprise anybody um, in this group that um, The Guardian, uh, a news organization um, that has always been very clear and explicit uh, about its commitment to liberal and progressive values has significantly higher reach in this group than it has in the public at large, uh, almost twice the weekly reach amongst those who say there are issues in which it makes no sense for outlets to try to be neutral. But I think it's important to recognize that while news organizations, in my view, face a choice about whether they will try to be neutral on every issue uh, or want to take a more explicit stand on at least some of the issues um, that divide us, as The Guardian has done on uh, the climate issue and on many social justice issues, 
and of course, as many other British newspapers have done on other issues, such as this country's relationship with the European Union, from the point of view of citizens, it's not either or. So, for example, the BBC, um, with its commitment to do impartiality... Uh, Sorry, Rasmus, very... I'm just going to interrupt you. Sorry, um, the slides are not moving. The slides are not moving. No. Okay, that's worrying. Um, so much for the uh, testing. Um, are they moving now? Yes. Are we at the BBC? Now we're on the Guardian time? and BBC News slide. Okay. Well, um, thanks, Mira. Um, thank you. And we'll pass it on to all participants yeah. afterwards as well. Okay. Um, so, you know, the BBC with its commitment to do impartiality, uh, which critics may sometimes sort of see as collapsing into he said, she said coverage, bordering on false balance, again, with sort of oversight by Ofcom, uh, with the most politically balanced online news audience in the UK, and a brand that is highly trusted across the political spectrum, also by many on the political right, also has uh, even higher reach amongst those who say it make no sense for news outlets to try to be neutral um, than it has in the public at large. And if we look at the sort of other brands that have a high weekly cross-platform reach in the group um, who say there are issues in which make no sense to um, try to be neutral, ITV News, also Ofcom regulated, Sky News, again, same, Channel 4, again, the same, then Daily Mail, which like The Guardian is very clear about its values, and then local newspapers, uh, many of whom uh, are also uh, trying to aspire to a version of, uh, of impartiality for their local and regional um, audiences. So um, it's clear um, that um, outlets that are very explicit about their position, not only the Guardian, but also the Mail, uh, of course, have significant reach also amongst those who say they believe outlets should be neutral in every issue just as those who try to stay impartial um, have a high reach also amongst those um, who um, believe that outlets should try to be neutral. They clearly give people something they want, even if they don't give them everything um, that they want. Where does that leave us? Um, I think it leaves us uh, at the point where, from the point of view of citizens, while a minority that is more active on, uh, than most in social media think differently, the majority of the UK public say they want news outlets to be neutral in every issue. But whether any individual citizen believe this or not, in a diverse and high choice media environment, people can easily have their cake and eat it too. They can use both outlets to try to be neutral and those to take a stance. And indeed, many people do. Um, impartial outlets serve many who want greater moral clarity and many who want neutrality also use outlets to take a stance. There is room for and public appetite for different approaches. However, from the point of view of news outlets, um, I think that audience research would suggest that there is a choice to be made, that there is a trade-off that I think of as the journalist's trilemma, where everything that deserves the name of journalism uh, is committed to seeking truth and reporting it. Um, but there are other values one might aspire to as well, um, a desire to serve the whole public in an impartial fashion, and a desire for moral clarity on important but often divisive issues. But I think in practice, news organizations um, have to engage in trade-offs between the latter two. It is hard to both uh, be full-throated on the issues that divide us and serve the whole public in a way they will recognize as duly impartial. So in irreducibly diverse and disputatious societies where we often disagree and where all of us have access to many different voices and points of view, it's hard to see how any one news organization can simultaneously take a clear stance on the issues and divide us and at the same time effectively seek to serve everybody in an impartial way. This does not mean that any one choice on how to approach this is inherently superior or that every organization ought to make the same choice. Uh, but I think our research documents that news organizations will have to choose. So I will stop sharing here and we'll uh, make sure we circulate the slides. Sorry about the tech hiccup. Thanks very much, Erasmus. Um, I'm just going to make one point and then please do raise your hands via the Zoom function for discussion because I really want to throw this out there. But Tim, can I take Rasmus's last point back to you, please, about the trilemma? And I'd be really interested to know your response in whether you agree, and if so, how how we navigate that as a as, as journalists, where you have the need to seek truth and report it, serve the whole public and work with moral clarity, and you don't always hit all three at once. Cr crucially serve the whole public. So I think that's something that's almost impossible to do all the time. 
inevitably, but it's worth the struggle. Is my reaction? Yeah. So I, I think I think we, we make a choice, which is 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 if you it, I mean everyone on this call knows this is is by choosing uh, uh, impartiality and objective reporting, and this is one of the the, the you know joys of the job is you are always striving to probably a perfection that isn't, you'll, you'll always fall short. The issue is how close you are to that and the, the effort of exploring it in of itself is valid. So I think one of the things that I'd say to Rasmus is openly discussing that dilemma and working through that in through issues, does this reflect the, I mean, my issue around, you know, or challenge around the BBC's impartiality was just, ensuring that culturally we opened ourselves up to as wide a debate as possible and we didn't have blind spots of significance in terms of public points of view debate different opinions so i i think there are traps i mean it's very interesting what rosen said about those people who are on twitter uh, i mean i was in the newsroom the other day and someone said to me oh look what's going on twitter look what young people are saying i said i don't know a lot of young people on twitter myself i mean i've got young i mean young young people um, uh, you know, this is not a representative sample. And I think the, the, in that um, challenge that Rasmus laid out, you've got to be really careful about where you get your understanding of broad points of view. That's what I'd say. And I think that, that got harder in a world in which people are self-publishing uh, as opposed to just the broadcast world and a research-based world. That has got harder. But I recognise the dilemma. I think it's a struggle. Simple as that. Thanks very Or trilemma. Much. Sorry, I, did I call it a dilemma? Tri I'm underplaying it. It's a trilemma. OK. Thanks very much, Tim. In the name of gender balance, I'm going to skip order and go straight to Mariana Matsukato for your question. Thank you. So, thanks. Um, I guess I'm, I'm sort of here as an academic who's been thinking about issues around public value, and I'll put in the chat later a report we've just published on this because it does relate to uh, this issue. But I actually wanted to raise something more just kind of as an economist, which is I feel like there's a parallel to something that's been happening within the economics profession, which then got us really stuck, which is the language. So this idea that you know government is there and the public sector is there to level the playing field <laughs> Um, makes no sense, right? Because if you're actually trying to achieve transformational growth, if you're trying to achieve inclusive growth, if you're trying to achieve, you know, uh, sustainability and so on, you actually have to tilt the playing field, right? And that doesn't mean then choosing one line, like in this case, it would be like one viewpoint. Um, it doesn't mean in economics to choose one sector or one type of firm, but it definitely means choosing a direction, right? And I just wonder if there's a parallel there that this idea of impartiality has created this kind of like vacuum in terms of the vocabulary, the storytelling of what we're actually trying to do. But the other thing is that this is happening at the same time that there's this skepticism towards the so-called experts, which I feel like also tinges this debate, right? That when you get an expert, often a progressive expert talking about climate change, their view has to be then counterbalanced with someone else's point of view. And in my case, I can tell you as an economist on the news, whether it was I was talking about Brexit or climate change, the person that then the BBC brought on to talk to me, and I hate to put it this way, but they weren't that informed, right? So when you are going, like, it's kind of apples and oranges, and it's not like, oh, I'm smart, they're stupid, but it, there must be some criteria where when you're bringing these different points of view, there's almost like a test <laughs> of, of grounding of where that expertise or knowledge is actually coming from. I mean, I found myself talking to Toby Young about Brexit and I, I, there was just like very little like grounding. And lastly, um, uh, I can't remember what I was gonna say actually, so that's it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, can I give that back to Tim to answer and then I'll... Yeah, fascinating. I think there's um, some really, the first bit of the question, which is, this idea of balancing or tilting, I think it's really profound actually. I, I, interestingly, I, I worry slightly that we perceive public service media like the BBC, or if we perceive it as a balance to what's going on. Let me explain what I mean. Or, Cause I think that can provoke a market failure mindset. You with me? Which, which my view is, it, I really worry if public service broadcasting is about market failure. So you've got things that are working for the market and then you've got things that you do purely for societal good. 
as it were, yeah? And I think I worry about that because I think we're, we, we've created, we can create hybrid public private models that affect the whole climate, the whole of the climatic conditions rather than polarizing them of themselves in that way. Let me give you, so in the UK, I believe that, you know, there is high quality press in the UK. Sky News is a good service. Yeah. Uh, 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 there, and I think that properly constructed regulation, properly constructed in, you know, mass appeal, entertaining news broadcasting from the BBC on BBC One, not on a small news channel. Yeah. So that that is the prize here. It's not about having a high fiber niche balancing act. If I if I, I, I'm deliberately exaggerating what you said there. And I my model is very much these rather enlightened mixes of public and private interventions that lead to main street, mainstream and and standards being very high. And I think that works whether it's in the UK, whether it's in drama or news. And, and I actually that's what I'm hunting as opposed to just being a balance. Your point on expert, experts is so interesting as well. It's another uh, widely debated topic. I think the first thing is if you've got an expert, I, mean, I won't go into the ins and outs of that specific example, but the truth is you do want people with serious knowledge and people who take the debate forward, I totally take your point. There is a category of people, and it's really interesting, that have popular appeal and seem to speak for a big section. And I'm just wrestling with this publicly <laughs> with this group. They speak for a section or they're allowed voice in the debate. And sometimes I think it is valid, and this is dangerous territory, but bringing them into a debate and exploring what's behind their voice is slightly different to getting a world-class expert, but is also valid in terms of democratic debate to explore people who are getting traction in debates. I think we have to be careful not to just make it people with deep, dare I say, academic or fit, but we're also interrogating those people who have got a degree of tr traction in the, in it, through their populism. I think that is a struggle and we need to make sure that they are properly cast as such. But I do think that is a phenomenon that we're now dealing with and you need to deal with it proactively. Thanks very much. Um, and I know that's an issue, quite a few people in this room have, um, thoughts on as well. Um, Stephen Coleman. Thank you. Um, look, I think everything that Rasmus said to us. Could you speak up a little? Sorry, we can't quite hear you. Right. I think that everything that Rasmus was saying, can you hear me now? A bit better. I'll repeat the question otherwise. Okay. I think that everything that Rasmus was saying to us is right, if you think about it in the context of a rules-based order. But my question is, how should journalism address intentional mendacity when it is presented by legitimately elected politicians, either domestically or internationally? If, for example, a politician predicts an outcome of a policy or of an event that he or she knows will not occur simply in order to excite or scare or infuse <laughs> is it the task of journalism to call that out that's rather too late to do so afterwards in some situations so one might offer for example equal time to opponents of the claim to refute it but the ethical question it seems to me still remains why should public interest journalism give any space whatsoever to intentional mendacity. And this becomes a relevant question when intentional mendacity is the standard communication strategy of a number of established political organizations in this country and beyond. Now, most of us here will probably agree that the intentional spreading of falsehood should be called out. And I like Tim's idea, incidentally, of, of casting people in a particular role. But the question is, how do we do this without being vulnerable to accusations of partiality? 
my final short answer is that I would offer the answer that public service communicators should not simply espouse a negative form of impartiality. That is to say, they need to be clear and to um, not do certain things. But what is needed is an imaginative, positive commitment to values, which while always remaining open to critical deliberation, constitute clear and foundational principles of communication that will be called out whenever they are breached. Thanks very much. Really, um, really important point. I'll start briefly with Rasmus at this moment, if it's OK, because we have, um, you know, we've kind of looked at this issue of essentially of um, how do journalists address the issue of intentional mendacity when it comes from politicians very deliberately and very knowingly. <laughs> I'm very glad you raised the question, Stephen. Um, I think of that as uh, one of the hardest illustrations of why I believe news organizations fade a trade off. Um, and I think the, the key to it lies in the term intentional. Um, I think we would struggle to find very many examples, even examples that each of us individually would be fully convinced were intentional mendacity, that the supporters of those politicians would accept as such. Um, and I, I have to say that all the audience research we do at the Institute suggests that um, you know, being very clear and direct um, and using very plain language, lies, for example, um, and being very clear about asymmetrical threats to democracy, which I personally consider very real and very challenging and very problematic, um, over time uh, have a consequence in terms of which parts of the public are likely to pay attention to a new source, let alone trust it. Um, so I suppose that's why I think news outlets have to make a choice uh, about what they would rather on the balance do and accept that there are costs to those choices and that some uh, who uh, put moral clarity first have, I think, greater autonomy to be very clear about such problems as the ones you describe, um, and, but that those who um, privilege uh, the ambition of universal service and a recognition of the due impartiality will be constrained in their ability to call such things out in the absence of hard evidence. How would we know it was intentional? And how would we agree that it was mendacious in, 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 in societies characterized by value pluralism and, and differences of opinion and differences of political loyalty? Those calls are exceedingly hard to make in a way that is purely evidence-based, I think. Thanks very much. And Tim? Yeah, I think Rasmus has nailed, nailed the tensions in some ways. I think from our point of view as the BBC, we, we are quite rightly, I think, not in the game necessarily of too quickly ascribing motivation or labels, which I think sometimes can cloud the ability to look at the evidence. Yeah. And I think this is exactly what Rasmus is saying in terms of, but our instincts are to do the fact checks, the truth tellers, the working on the data and the evidence. And obviously, what I would say, by the way, is that doesn't have to be wholly looking backwards. So if you look at climate change and some of the predictions and where people are going, a lot, you know, you look at data, you look at probability, you look at experts. I think you can get into some fairly, I mean, we get into quite um, debated territory around our fact checks. Yeah. And our what we call our reality checks. But we hold strong on that because they're often... You know, we're, we're very strong in our evidence-based journalism. Where I agree uh, in terms of, you know, is there is a tension, which is how far you go to labelling people. I personally think that that can be a dangerous territory for us because you're often beyond the evidence. And that, I think, can do ourselves a disservice. I mean, Rasmus is right about the line we, work, uh, we walk, but I think that's where we are, honestly, as the BBC which is we want to be an evidence-based organization. That, that, now, critically, that doesn't mean a lack of flavor. It doesn't mean call, we can't call a story, but it's the nature of how you're calling a story and the evidence set by which you're, doing, you're sitting on to do that. That's what I would say. I, I, am, I, am, I, I think that's where we need to be. And by the way, the positive point uh, and the positive case, I think, is utterly critical we make that, as opposed to just being on the back foot and defensive, as I may, I, I said that earlier. I think that's really critical and a big point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alan. 
Um, I, I guess this is both Tid Tim and Rasmus. I mean, I, I personally think that the BBC does really well uh, to to struggle with this issue and and to um, and to behave in an impartial way. And I've read back through the last five years of Ofcom reports, and Ofcom looks at this every year, and and Ofcom seems broadly to agree. The, the problem is that the issue is largely mediated through uh, a press that tilts to the right, and many of whom have their own competitive reasons for not wishing the BBC well. And I suspect they will never admit or concede that the BBC uh, does a good job of impartiality. So two questions. One is, who is the independent arbiter that could possibly be convincing uh, in respect of holding the ring in this debate? Uh, and the second is, I, I suppose, for Tim, uh, how do you watch the backs of BBC journalists who must feel under terrible pressure uh, uh, to um, comply with the overwhelming uh, drumbeat that they read in the newspapers every day that tells them that they're not being uh, ambitious? Uh, uh, how, how do you uh, make sure that they are protected uh, in, in the work that they do? Thank you, Alan. And um, yeah, very good questions. Welcome to the, uh, as you know, the life of the BBC executive. <laughs> executive. I, th I think the um, the arbiter point, and let's just talk about that. I, I think you're absolutely right, by the way. I'm not expecting in some of the uh, leading press publications to, for a, uh, a rousing endorsement of the way the BBC news is performing. You're not in, you're not in a impartial environment in some of those environments, clearly. Um, I think there's, you mentioned it, sorry, sorry to repeat the point, but I think you need a regulator, which we do have, which has to be strong and independent as a data set. I think that really is important. I mean, you went there, but imagine we didn't have that. You know, I just, if you step back from the whole thing, having Ofcom as an independent regulator in the way that they are, being able to do their business with proper objectives. And then we might debate with Ofcom the ins and outs of the data set and all of that, but actually it's a very important thing we need to protect um, throughout throughout. I think the other thing is, I mean, honestly, I feel encouraged and, and it links then to the second question, which is public data and public proper public understanding is just the bedrock of what we do. Yeah. And, and I think that the, the thing we must do is not wholly be led by um, those interested parties who have an agenda with regard to the shape of the media market and where we want to be in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, frankly, the, they want to see the BBC diminished. Um, I, I absolutely think we need public data. I've always been very focused on household value and the support we're getting from the public and making that transparent and clear. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't got any magic answers on that, but I honestly think that gives you a bedrock um, because beneath all the noise, that that is where the truth is. It's in terms of uh, in, in terms of um, uh, the BBC and its support. The journalist is a really good question. I mean, the truth is that we're having to fight this every day. So, and again, your ex, your, your your expertise is high on this. But I've never felt a time where you know, if you're an editor, the amount of pressure you're getting, and often it's not actually traditional news media so uh, new, news. Um, coverage that's the issue it's social if i'm honest it's social it's constant pressure on social media i mean rasm that's if you talk to most journalists it's it, there are real real life incidents we've seen some pretty horrid stuff over the last year but thankfully they're in the minority it's it's intense social media criticism and it's pretty di difficult all i would say is we we aside from the more uh, the, the structured elements of support we're giving to journalists, security support, all of that. And unfortunately, we have to do this. Uh, and, and give them, I think we just have to keep confidence levels up and really connect them with the public and what they're doing. And I think that we're holding that up. I, I actually, I remain naively optimistic in this. People look at me and say, you know, it's all a bit beleaguered. And isn't it? It's not actually that where the public is and the public numbers, we should be confident that there's a real demand for what we do and not be led by you know, 100 people on Twitter is not how we need to be, uh, and we need to reinforce that with our news colleagues, that they do not represent the mainstream view. And I just think you have to keep that absolutely clear in an organization and very, very strong. Thank you. There's quite a lot of raised hands. So if it's okay, I'm going to move straight on to them. Jen, Jen Burks. 
We can't hear you yet. I've forgotten how to use Zoom. There you go. Thanks to Teams. Um, I'd like to return to um, Reality Check, if I may. Um, because Reality Check is absolutely brilliant. I agree, it's fantastic. And I think it really does um, deliver on BBC's remit uh, enormously. But um, it is sidelined, it's online. People do have to seek it out or they find it on social media out of context and don't really understand what it is. Um, and I think the risk is that fact-based impartial journalism can inadvertently exclude that kind of uh, fact-checking or, or weight of evidence kinds of reporting that is perhaps more effective. A lot of research sort of indicates that it is more effective, particularly in challenging the kinds of motivated reasoning that people um, give the PBC pelters for on social media. Um, for perceiving balance, um, sorry, imbalance and bias against their own perspective. Um, so I, I think even though fact checking is an interpretive form of journalism, that actually it has a really strong role still to play in mainstream journalism rather than just being online for reality check or the occasions when that comes into the mainstream. Um, and so Picking up on at the beginning, um, Rasmus was talking about climate change as an example of an issue where people don't think that necessarily uh, the news can be neutral. Um, and on the uh, reference to false balance, I, one of the things that concerns me is how do we draw the line between fact and opinion? When does scientific opinion become settled science? So when do we really challenge um, climate denial arguments as strongly as, for instance, the Day Today programme has been doing recently in terms of Putin's um, out and out propaganda, as an example of the, the sort of mendacity that was mentioned earlier. So that kind of is a more of a difficult line, I think, when really the problem is risk and uncertainty and people's understanding of those um, very finely balanced, difficult kind of. Um, Divisions, if that Thank, makes any sense. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's going to be a really important point the efficacy and reach and place of fact checking in journalism. Um, shall I start with you, Rasmus, and then I'll move to Tim? Um, I mean, I'm happy to, to respond to some of the, the points, but I, I also consciously have a fantastic group, and I, I wonder whether it might be good to hear from, from some of the others. I'll just say I'm glad that Jen raised it, and I I think it's important and I think it's a shame that fact checking and debunking currently is largely confined to an online environment where people have to seek it out. Um, but uh, I'm glad to say we were in discussion with the BBC about some uh, other research on that topic um, that we'll be sharing in March. So. I mean, do you want me to be very quick, which is, uh, I, I think we could do more. I would be careful about using the word sidelined online, by the way, just I've got a few defensive twitches here. One is, one is, but the number of people going online, I mean, you know, Ross Atkins is getting millions on. We, we, we've got to worry about traditional broadcast thinking as well, by the way. Sorry. I mean, our biggest service over time will be online and the news app. It won't be the six. Yeah. It, it, I mean, uh, so I've got to be careful, you know, it, th th this is online has to work and online gives us potential for people to explore stories in the way you're talking about. Where, to be fair, we, we do use a lot of facts and we check facts on, on our broadcast. I could name more or less. I could do this. I could do that. But I take the challenge. I agree with you. We need to do more of what you're talking, but we also need to do something else, which is the editors of themselves. And that relates to your point about risk and uncertainty. It's not just about a slightly dry, it can still be interesting and, and brilliantly put together reality check. It's also about an editor calling a story, looking at it, explaining a bit of the risks and uncertainty and a degree of transparency around the struggle, I think is part of the thing, is part of what we need. Otherwise, we are simply into a data set or a, or, or an, an, so I think we have to navigate the course. But the truth is, I, I agree with the central thrust of what you're saying. And I think more and more people are going to have an appetite for, look, let's strip back the noise and give us what the facts are and the BBC can provide. And it's a big, big area of opportunity for us. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do now is, Jean, you've had your hand raised for a while. Can make your point. I'm going to ask you and then I'm going to ask Richard to both make your points and then throw it back to you. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for very interesting points. Can I just say something that I think that the discussion has been confused 
because it's been about views. There is one set of issues, which is public opinion, how it's made, what constructs it. And if a lot of people believe that the world is, you know, flat, that in itself is a very important thing. If more of them believe it, that's one question. There are other things which are contested around things like science, but they're, they are the, the, the method by which reality is ascertained is different. And all of that's different, it seems to me, from moral voice. I mean, the BBC's had a long tradition of moral voices on it, Charles Wheeler, you know, Richard Dimbleby, um, but moral but moral voice as an institution, you're, the only morality you've got is the story. And it seems to me the answer to all of those is turning everything into a story. You should never sit on an agreed thing. You, you, you must always find out what, what's going on and be curious about the story. And I, I, that seems to me gets rid of some of those dilemmas. So I just wanted to, and I don't think moral authority is something that you could easily actually claim to have, frankly. Really good point, thank you. I'm gonna hold, pause on that thought and pass over to Richard. Thank you, thank you, Mira. Um, I think this has been a fascinating discussion and a very useful piece of research from Rasmus because it seems to me that uh, the most important thing Tim said at the beginning was that the BBC and I think other public service broadcasters should be proud of impartiality and should actually proclaim it as being uh, an extremely valuable quality, um, which if we don't look after it, it's going to disappear. Uh, and I think that the fundamental um, worry I have about serious journalism is that, as Rasmus's research suggests, we're at the parting of the ways. Uh, those people whose business plan is based on subscription, of listening very carefully to segments of the audience, are going in the, in the area of, he would say, moral clarity. Um, I think moral clarity is one way of describing it. Somebody who doesn't like that particular moral clarity might say it's partiality in one case or the other. You compare the Times and the Guardian's coverage of trans issues, and you've got two extremely good newspapers taking diametrically opposed views of a really difficult and toxic subject and reporting completely different stories in many cases. So it, I mean, it seems to me that um, in public service broadcasting, whether it's uh, the BBC or, or in commercially funded public service broadcasting, I've worked in both, everybody pays. Everybody has the right to their views treated with respect. And that respect for the audience in a very polarizing world where on social media, there's no respect for the audience. The audience is told what to think. Uh, and it seems to me that one of the things that the BBC as the leading player in impartial journalism, but also there are other allies, there's ITN, the Sky, there's an organization like Reuters who believe in impartial journalism. There needs to be a very positive view that we're not on the defensive. Yes, BBC gets things wrong. Yes, people don't get end up being interviewed and they don't think much of the person they've they're balanced with. We all accept that that's you know part of the part mm. of the downside of trying to do what we do. <laughs> but the positive side of keeping impartiality in the world we're moving into needs to be proclaimed and defended. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, yeah, very, very helpful comments and uh, wise words as ever from Jean and Richard. I think on, on Jean's point, I think fascinating. I mean, I was touching on that earlier a little about this idea of where views are formed, which I think is really profound. And, and as opposed to you, you've got facts, you've got experts, you've also got views emerging. And I think you, you, it links a little bit to my point that sometimes you need you need to investigate and understand where those views are coming from and break them down and interrogate them. And that is that is demanding in this climate, but I think it's absolutely what we should do. I couldn't agree with you more. I think you put it word perfectly in terms of the story, the evidence, the curiosity for the story is, is the lifeblood of the organisation. Simple as that. And I think if we come to it from a, I, I agree, they're more dangerous than they ever were. Any kind of moral, you know, kind of, we're not deploying moral authority here. We're, we're finding a story, but we could be calling a story and where it goes and its evidence. And I think, and, and we're, we have to be ceaselessly curious to go and find every angle rather than just try and build a narrative that we choose to want to deploy in the world. That is absolutely central to us. Now that then links to Richard's point, which is, I mean, I think I, uh, Richard, you'd say, I mean, I, since I took over, I've been very clear and trying to push impartiality. It, it often gets reduced to, you know, in fact, defensive kind of policing of the BBC. 
But there's something more fundamental here about, you know, democratic society, what we and I, I think you're spot on. The risks are extremely real. The thing that's new in my mind is the how people ascribe intent to you very, very quickly. So if I ask a question of one side in, of a politician, immediately someone assumes you are of the opposing side. So the idea that we all assume that the BBC may not be a perfect job, but its intent is clear to try and get the truth or get some journalism done. That, I can tell you, is harder in my job because people go, no, it's because you're to the left, you're to the right, you're anti this, you're anti... So really training our people to have the strength. And I think sometimes showing our intent more clearly and more transparently, which to this group might be obvious, but we're, try we're curious for the story and the truth. And we've got to take that fight on. And I can tell you people coming into the BBC often need a bit more work to get understanding around what that means and what it doesn't mean in terms of leaving your campaigning self behind, potentially, which may not just be delineated along left-right lines. So often it will be seen as social issues and other things, and that's where it gets a right struggle. But I tell you what, it's a, it's, it's a fight we are taking on, and I couldn't agree with what you were saying more. I think this is the time, it, in some ways, we're more valuable than we were ever, we, we've ever been by taking that fight on. And we have made a choice to the BBC, by the way, very deliberately, to keep that fight for an impartial space where all views are welcome, definitely. Thank you. Rasmus. Thanks. Just very briefly, um, I mean, I think that public opinion matters hugely in terms of understanding impartiality. Um, and I wouldn't personally want to live in a world in which that's left to a sort of council of guardians uh, to decide. Um, journalism exists in the context of its audience um, and uh, the 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 preconditions both of its role in society uh, and the long-term sustainability of journalism as a private enterprise and even more so as a form of public service is in my view uh, wholly reliant on the relationship uh, with the public and public opinion research is an excellent way of understanding that. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't roles for regulators or experts but frankly uh, you know at the end of the day uh, if regulators and experts called an organization impartial and the public disagreed it would not be impartial in a full sense of the word, and certainly couldn't fulfill its role as impartial if it was seen that way by the public. Uh, on Richard's point, I just wanna say, I'm really glad you raised it. And I, I think there is a role here also for research because uh, uh, I think there is a, a, um, a risk sometimes that in the sort of uh, chattering classes and the sort of punditocracy, there is a perception that the majority of news consumption is driven by sort of polarizing and partisan voices. That is entirely untrue not at all supported by evidence. Uh, the majority of news consumption uh, also in a country such as the United States, which is very polarized uh, and where there are very polarized voices, goes to, to sources that, that people who respect them will call sort of centrist or, or impartial and critics will say are, are sources that engage in false balance. Uh, and that's the case in the United States as well as, as it is uh, very much so in the UK. Thanks very much. Now, we've got, we're, we're in, coming up to the last five minutes. Um, Kirsty, who couldn't raise a hand, but I know has a question and Noel and Steve Barnett. I'll come to all three of you. Kirsty. Hi, yeah, I mean, it sort of follows up, um, follows on from um, something that Richard was, was saying and Rasmus and, um, and Tim really just now. I just wonder whether the panel thinks that actually it's almost impossible for any news outlet to ever be completely um, unbiased and balanced because the people who work for a particular news outlet will always have um, some element of unconscious bias uh, within them. So how can um, the BBC, for instance, claim to be um, impartial or balanced? I, I think it comes back to the staff who work within. And I just wonder whether people feel that um, make, making sure that there's a sufficient cross section of society which um, who work for any, um, news outlet has a bearing on that impartiality and that and that balance. Really, really important point. Noel, you following on? I just wanted to come in because that was uh, and thanks for this and Rasmus for the excellent research. That was my point. You know, I, I take what Alan and Richard said uh, in terms of how the BBC is performing, how Ofcom report that. We see that across Europe, and it's important to say that. I see all of those figures for the European broadcasters and the trust levels 
the reports from regulators around Europe are really strong and we need to not be afraid to say that. Where we fall down is Kirsty's point, which is we're talking a lot about the presenter, but we all know the producers and editors are the ones making the, a lot of the really big decisions. And the decisions can be influenced by background, they can be influenced. And I, I go to broadcasters all over Europe and we're not reflective. You know, let's be honest in terms of age, gender, diversity, social background. Uh, and how do we crack that? You know, how do we do it? Thanks very much, Noel. Just going to um, go to Steve Barnett. Thanks. Um, I, I, my concerns, I think, are very similar to Jean's and Rich's, actually. But so I've just got a, a, one quick question, which is, uh, Tim, I, I wrote down one of the things you said, strip back the noise to tell us what the facts are. And I think that's a really important journalistic imperative, which goes to the heart of what the BBC does. But there's the other side of it, which is about holding the ring for other people's opinions. Yeah. Uh, and I think that raises questions about the BBC's role as uh, the circus master, so to speak, particularly in a world where opinions are becoming, as you said, more and more divisive. Does that raise questions about, for example, the future of Question Time uh, and other programmes where you, it is arguable that there is actually uh, no real uh, factual merit. There is no stripping back. In fact, it's increasing the heat and the noise. It's not stripping back and it's not telling us about facts. One could even extend that to certain kinds of interviews, for example, on Newsnight, which are clearly set up, and I've been involved in them myself, to pit one view against a completely opposing view. So are there questions there for the BBC about the way in which it should behave as the ringmaster. Thanks okay. very much. Um, I think there's just one final hand, Giovanni Jonas. What I might do is ask you uh, to ask you a question very quickly and then give the floor back to Tim which for, for, for a roundup. I just wanted to dive into uh, a bit more deeply what Tim was talking about uh, 100 uh, people on, on Twitter um, pouring shit on one BBC presenter doesn't actually uh, uh, mean a row of beans in the, in the wider public. My concern is just that the shift in, in the people I teach in, in uh, uh, City University, the, the 22 year olds who want to go into the profession of, of, of journalism, there's so much into social media, when I ask how many people here have listened to the Today programme in the last month or tuned into any news broadcast in real time or paid for a newspaper in the last month, it's not sort of uh, you know, fewer than 50%, it's pretty close to zero. You know? That just doesn't touch people in their 20s now. And, and I look at the way that uh, Laura Koonsberg in particular, but a range of our uh, I still say are ah, the, the range of BBC presenters are vilified on, on, on Twitter. Um, so when 20 year olds are getting pretty much all their information from social media, then how much can you just ignore what's going down on Twitter, which is so passionate uh, and, uh, and, and so distorted? Thanks very much, Bunny. Should I, should I go for it, Mira, quickly? Yeah. Um, obviously, Kirsten Knowles' point, absolutely critical in terms of the makeup of uh, the B yeah, an organisation like the BBC. And we're already at the cutting. I mean, we're really pushing very hard because I think the risk of groupthink is real. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and I think it's about uh, diversity of experience, all those things that you need to do. I'm going to say one thing that might be slightly, you know, uh, kind of counter counter that slightly, which is no one is doing more than myself. We went out to 16% of the BBC is BAME, which is beyond population. We're pushing for 20. I could go through various groups, socioeconomic groups, et cetera, et cetera. But it goes deeper. And, and I think what I would say, however, is I think we aren't in a position where if three people are making a program, their life experience has, we're going to get situations where they're not fully reflective or they can't fully get to it within their own so-called lived experiences. Therefore, you've got to have a broader culture and you've got to have ways of listening 
and research and debate and thinking that goes beyond just the team of itself. And I think some people are searching for a precious, oh, every team in the, is going to be perfectly representative of the community. I want to do that as much as anyone, but it will not happen full. It's not the full answer. And I think you need a culture that sits across the everything, the information you're getting, the quality of, um, you know, in the BBC, using our regional, our local services, that, really, that is as important as simply just reconfiguring the organization. And it's culture that sits above everything, not just the numbers. On um, where were we next? Um, in terms of Steve, look, it's a very good pick up. I, I think we definitely should be holding the ring and we have a role of circus master. The truth is we could, we, you and I could spend some time talking about how well we're doing that in the various buckets, uh, whether it's question time or others, we're always looking to improve. What I would say, by the way, is I think I am interested in how we could do more of that at say the local level, the regional, how do we facilitate local democracy or, and democracy? But the risk, Steve, the thing I'm struggling with just being very open about is how do you make that truly representative, not just 20 people who are particularly active? Yeah, and I think that's a real interesting challenge. And how could digital technology facilitate broader engagement, broader things that, you, that the services you're talking about, circus. So I think we're at the foothills of potentially looking at new models. And I think I'm, I'm very interested in that because it is our role. I take the challenge. Last thing, um, I wasn't, Barney, I wasn't saying we should ignore social media. I was, I was making a more, I was poor, my phrasing was poor, but I was basically saying, if you're a journalist, don't think the hundred people on Twitter is you know, representative of everyone. That's a different point to a degree. I think absolutely the BBC needs to look at fresh ways of delivering content, be, be absolutely present in social media. I'm meeting with the social media companies, uh, talking about how we, how our services are on those. I would just be a little bit cautious because the BBC News, if it's on these social media platforms, sometimes doesn't get the attribution so there's a question of it's all very well doing it, but what at the end of the day, I need people to justify the license fee bluntly. So how do we get those arrangements in place? But we should be there. Um, last thing, by the way, I wouldn't give up on linear, even though your students are saying they're not listening. The data suggests slightly is, is not quite as um, binary as that or polarized. 80% of young people are coming to the BBC, 16 to 34s are coming to the BBC every week and the news penetration numbers are still good. Now, I'm not being naive. There is a burning fire in terms of 16 to 34s and making sure we get them into our services. But it's not quite as polarised as, as, as the position that some would say. And I, and I think the final thing is people are always, and, and to the end of the session, everyone's always gone to polarised sources. Young people are smart. They go, and they go to a raging, just like you might go to the Daily Mail, gossip column one moment and go and do a deep read the next on the real, or a reality check. Young people are no different in that. They go to multiple sources. We don't need to be all of their news. We need to be one of their key sources. Tim, thanks so much. And we're pretty much, you know, an hour exactly from when we started speaking. So um, I'm going to have to draw it to a close. I think we could carry on talking. Thank you all so much for coming and for your contributions and for being part of this conversation, both in this hour and more generally.